right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined from Melbourne, Australia by Rachel Robertson. How are you doing, Rachel? I'm good, John. How are you doing? <laughs> Really good. And we're gonna, we have an unusual topic to talk about today because we often talk about leadership uh, on this podcast. But today we're going to talk about leadership insights from the world's most extreme workplace. And some of you may think your workplace is pretty extreme, but we're talking about the, and we're talking about Antarctica because Rachel spent 12 months on the ice in Antarctica leading a, a team there. Um, before we get started, just give the background to your to how you ended up in Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> sure, and, and I would love to tell you it was a brilliant strategic career move, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. I, um, I saw the job advertised in the newspaper and what intrigued me was the Antarctic Division, which is similar mm -hmm. to the U US Antarctic Program. They recruit for personal qualities. So they recruit mm -hmm. for resilience, empathy, and integrity. You actually don't need to know much about Antarctica because they figure they can teach you that in your training. They can't teach you mm -hmm. resilience or empathy. So I just thought, what a great way to recruit. What a fantastic way to recruit. So I never wanted mm -hmm. the job. I only ever wanted to get to the job interview stage so I could find out what their questions were and I could copy their questions mm -hmm. and bring them back to my team. Uh, I never wanted the job. After I applied, I find out they don't even have a job interview. They have a boot camp that goes for a week. And I end up on this boot camp with 13 men competing for this job. And then they rang me and offered it to me. And I thought, you know what? I'd rather regret what I did than regret yeah. what I didn't do. And that's, that's how I ended up there, but quite by accident. <laughs> <laughs> so when you, when you arrived, uh, so you went through your training and all that, and then you travel, you said it takes about two weeks to get to, to get to your destination. When you arrived in the first couple of days, were, were there some moments where you were kind of a bit overwhelmed and said, oh my goodness, like now I'm, I'm in a leadership position here in the midst of this crazy extreme place. Uh, am I up to it? Did you ever have any doubts at the beginning? Yeah, heaps, heaps, because mm -hmm. I was managing technical specialists. So I was managing mm -hmm. um, uh, Antarctic scientists, so climate change right. scientists. I was also managing a team of IT experts. And then there was a team of trades who were doing construction work and maintenance work and, and particularly the science. I mean, I, I'd never even heard of half the sciences like glaciology and seismology, mm -hmm. geomorphology, yeah. you know, and I'm, <laughs> I'm managing these people. And I did, I had to keep reminding myself, I'm not managing science, I'm managing people. And I've done that for 15, 16 years. And I had to, to, just to keep saying, you're not managing science, you're managing people. You're not managing IT, you're managing people. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's my strength. And so that was how I got through it, was just to keep coming back to that and reminding myself, I can, I can do that bit. That's the bit I can do. <laughs> I don't need to know the glaciology. I need to know how to manage the scientist who's doing the glaciology. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that's a really important point for people to take away because, you know, we live in a world that's becoming ever more complex. And I think in, in most jobs now, there are so many different tasks that need to be fulfilled and they're becoming very technical and very specialized. So often when you are in a leadership position, you are going to be in charge of people with very specialized skill sets. And that can be intimidating unless, as you say, you remind yourself that your job isn't to manage the technical part of it. Your job is to manage the person and their performance. Absolutely. And I think the higher up and more senior you get, that's more so because then it becomes you, you're bringing together teams and that's that collaboration mm -hmm. and getting various experts in, in various fields working as a team. And that was my, my goal or my aim was to get this team working together as a team and not as uh, just dis disparate or, or um, just individuals. I wanted them working as a team and that was my biggest challenge. And so how did you go about getting them working as a team? Because, I mean, I can imagine, as you said, you know, when you have scientists and then you have tradesmen and then you have IT people, let's face it, IT people can be difficult at the best of times. Uh, <laughs> so put them in the Ar Arctic. I'm only joking, of course. Um, but I mean, you've got all these people and then you put them in a remote setting where they're all kind of living on top of each other to some degree. I mean, how did you get them all to, to work together? The thing that fascinated me was it was it was the cognitive diversity that was my biggest challenge. I mm -hmm. I didn't see that coming. I thought it would be the demographic diversity, so the men and the women, or the, the you know, four generations, 
um, cultural differences, but it wasn't. It was actually that, that the big picture storyteller of the, the tradesman versus the really detailed um, brain of an electrical engineer from Germany. Mm -hmm. And when we met, the day we met, because I had no input to the recruitment of this team, I just got given 17 random people and told mm -hmm. to turn them into a team. And the day we met was the day I realised I have to do something here to set up my expectation for this team because we were so different. We were just so different. And as you said, we're together 24 hours a day. We cannot come home. We're stuck there mm -hmm. for a year. It's intensely, intense pressure. So I developed a mantra that respect Trump's harmony. And all it meant was we don't have to agree on everything. We don't have to love each other. We just have to treat each other with respect and always. And so that took off the table, this, this pressure of having to always get along and, and agree and be one big happy family because we weren't. We simply were just mm -hmm. very different people in a really intense situation. So I think I've probably said at least two or three times a day, respect Trump's harmony. We don't, you know, you don't have to agree with that person. Just just respect that they're different. Wow, and I think that's a message that the whole world could uh, maybe embrace today. Yeah, you know, that we can be, you know, we can differ and we can disagree, but you know, you should yeah. respect one another and maybe the world would be a a better place. So what was what was one of the early or can you remember one of the early moments when you thought, yes, I'm starting, this is starting to come together? The day we arrived. So so it takes about two weeks from Australia to sail down. Um, it's it's a lot further away than from mm -hmm. South America where the American stations um, dispatch from. So it's a two week, two weeks in the Southern Ocean. And that was fine because on the way on the way down on the ship, I was too busy planning science projects and I was in meetings all the time working out the program. It was the day we arrived and I was standing at the bridge um, looking at this, this view thinking, and I saw it and I thought, oh, what a, it's stunning. It's beautiful. And then mm -hmm. I'm thinking, oh my goodness. And I'm in charge. And in, in summer, mm -hmm we had 120 people on the station. So I'm managing 120 people and there's helicopters and planes and it's mm -hmm. just this mad operation. And I'm looking at it thinking, wow, this is exciting. And then I had this penny drop, this moment where it was like, oh my goodness, and, and I'm in charge, <laughs> I'm in charge. <laughs> and so I remember it vividly. And then I just had to, to break it down, you know, just to go, right, okay, get on with the job now. But yeah, it, it was this real moment of, wow, this is serious. This is actually serious. <laughs> Yeah, and I like what you just said there, right? So there was that moment of, wow, this is this is huge and all of that. But then the next moment was, okay, I have to break it down now into manageable chunks. And I think that's the that's the key takeaway. So how did you how did you then go about kind of taking it from this overwhelming into okay, here's manageable things and here's how I can start getting people working together? Yeah, it's and it's the same as what I've been doing through this pandemic. It's just breaking mm -hmm. it down into what do I do the next hour? What do I do the next yeah. week? Um, I even now we're in we're in lockdown still in Melbourne, and I mm -hmm. very rarely think about what will I be doing next month. And, sure. and even with my clients, we don't do a one year plan now. We're doing three month plans so we can get that mm -hmm. sense of momentum. And then that was the same in Antarctica that I, I've very rarely thought any further than maybe a couple of weeks out. So the two things I did was to break it down into the, you know, the next hour, the next day, the next week, but then also celebrating little victories along the way. So little things like when we achieved 50 days without an injury, I'd mm -hmm. write on the whiteboard in the dining room, great work, 50 days without an injury. And what that did was that gave a sense of progress that we're, we're moving mm -hmm. forward. We're actually, we're getting, uh, you turn those moments into momentum and you build this sense that we're, we're achieving, we're, we're doing good mm -hmm. stuff here, we're achieving. And so that sort of built that morale and it built that momentum, which was really important in that situation. And I guess for you, it obviously must have been personally challenging in some ways is that, you know, as you said, I mean, you're together 24-7, you're in this small place, you can't get away, that you have to sort of be on your game all the time, really. That was a big learning for me and I realised what I had been doing wrong all my corporate life because I thought my time management was was poor because I was first, when I was in corporate life, I was first in the office, last out, checking email at night and I thought, oh, my time management's so bad and I did everything they tell you to do and I was yeah. still working longer hours and I realised down south it was never my time management, it was actually my boundaries. And, and mm. I had to, I had to do that because the, the guys would knock on my bedroom door at night. They'd see the light shining under the, the door, and I'd say, I thought, well, that's my job. I'm the, I'm their yeah. leader. If they need me, I'm there. So I would, get, I'd yell out, "Yep, I'll come out. I'll put a jacket on. I'll come out." And I thought, I, I can't do this for 24 hours a day for a mm -hmm. year. It, it, will, it will just destroy me. So. The next time they interrupted me, I was having breakfast, I think, on a Sunday morning, and they wanted me to sign some paperwork to let them go and photograph penguins. 
And I actually said, look, this isn't urgent and I need to have my breakfast. So how about I have my breakfast and I'll meet you in my office in 15 minutes. How does that mm -hmm. sound? Once I put the boundary there, they respected it. But prior to that, I had no boundaries. And so that's why they would yeah. come to me at all hours. And I realized that's what I've been doing wrong my whole professional life. And so part of looking after myself was actually having that boundary and saying, when I retire for the night, that's it. Unless it's an emergency, I, I need that space and that privacy uh, and I'll see you in the morning. But I had, to, I had to manage that boundary. Yeah, and I think that's a really fascinating point as well for people to take away because I do think it's a trap that we can all fall into when we're in leadership positions. And what it can do is it almost takes it out of the hands that people don't have to make their own decisions. They don't have to prioritize because they say, oh, well, we just push it up to, just push it up to Rachel and she can decide on this. Once you set boundaries, it means that there are lots of things that maybe they have to look at and say, does this really need to go up that extra step or can I make a decision on it or can we resolve it ourselves? So in a way, by making yourself available all the time, you're actually disempowering as opposed to empowering, right? You really are. And one of the tools that helped with that was a tool we had called No Triangles. And No Triangles mm -hmm. is just, I don't speak to you about John. If I have yeah. something to say to him, I go directly to him. I don't take it to a third party. And initially, I did that to build respect in the team, because I think that's the respectful thing to mm -hmm. do, to, to go to the person directly and not complain yeah. about them behind their back. But it also freed up my time and more importantly, my energy, because I was listening to those conversations, again, like lots of leaders thinking, oh, they're just venting. They're just venting. My yeah. job's just to let them vent. And mm -hmm. it's not. It's disrespectful. But as soon as we implemented no triangles, I, I suddenly had the energy to go and see my, my good people. And I knew I needed to see them and tell them they're doing great because you mm -hmm. do. But I was so darn tired from these conversations. I didn't have the energy all the time. So that, that also put the responsibility back on the team to, to manage the, each other. I'm, by all means, if they couldn't sort it out, sure. I'd, I'd step in. But the first port of call was always directly to the person, no triangles. And just that simple tool alone changed the culture and, and it meant that they took responsibility for their own feelings and they, they dealt with issues themselves rather than, as you say, pushing it up, up the line to me all the time just because I happened to be with them 24 hours a day and mm -hmm. it was the easy thing to do. Uh, it meant that they had to do it themselves. So what was one of the... What, what were some of the things that surprised you about leadership in that environment that, as you said, I mean, you just, that was a classic one that you just said a few moments ago where that you learned that you didn't have a time management problem, you had a boundaries problem. Um, what are some of the other kind of surprising lessons that this environment taught you that you were able to bring back to, to the corporate space where it's a little less cold? One of the really important things was to be really explicit with my team that leadership is a behavior, not a title. Mm -hmm. And so I just made an assumption that most people would know that, that most people would realize that leadership is a behavior. Um, anyone can demonstrate leadership. It doesn't mean everyone is a leader, but anyone yeah. can demonstrate leadership behavior. And I actually had to say that. I had to use those words. I had to say, I expect you to demonstrate leadership. I expect if you see something that needs to be done, you'll do something about it. Or I expect if you've got a great idea, I want to hear it, bring it. Uh, and I had to say that out loud. And I thought, wow, I didn't know that. The other, other really important thing I learned was that to be an inspiring leader is about the moments. And people, you know, as, as the wonderful Maya Angelou said, people don't remember what you say or do. They remember how you make them feel. Mm -hmm. And that came home to me because my performance review was conducted by a third party, a psychologist who met my team privately on the way home and, and got feedback on my performance. And my team all ranked me as an inspiring leader because of these moments. One of them said, oh, she knew the name and hometown of all 120 people on the station over summer. And someone else mentioned, oh, my son had a school concert. And the next morning, Rachel said, oh, did you ring home last night? How was Lachlan's mm -hmm. concert? And it blew me away that I thought to be inspiring was about a charisma or personality. And it's not. It's about the moments and how you make your people feel. And that's what they, that's the feedback they gave to the psychologist about my, my leadership was that I'm an inspiring leader. And that blew me away because I, I did not see that coming at all, at all. So that was really important to learn for me. Yeah, and I, and I think that's such a fascinating, fascinating lesson because what you're describing there is the kind of the more, the human element of it. Um, and as you said, like treating people as individuals uh, as opposed to just as a, as a team. I um, mean, you know, that's, that's, that's really fascinating because I think right now these are very important lessons, particularly during the lockdown, because people are in, you know, a little bit discombobulated and are in situations they're not used to being in. And I think that 
what you just described is something that lead, that some people in leadership are discovering for the first time that that human element is really critical in order to connect with their teams. I think that is absolutely 100% spot on. And I think my team did not rank me as a great leader because I delivered a program on time on budget mm -hmm. or I maintained the safety of 120 people. They figured, or I managed, we had a, had a plane crash and I had to manage a search and rescue following a plane wow. crash. That wasn't on their radar because they figured that's my job. That's actually yeah, what I'm paid yeah. to do. And, and they didn't have any expectations other than mm -hmm. that's my job. But these little moments, these little moments where I remembered a name or I asked about their children and it was authentic and sincere. Um, even one, one guy mentioned he was mopping the floors one night and I came in to get a cup of tea and I put some chairs on the table to help him out. I didn't speak to mm -hmm. him, I just helped him out. He gave that feedback and I'm like, wow, you know, I just yeah. did that because that's what a decent person would do. But yeah, it blew me away. Yeah, and unfortunately, you know, decency and you know, respect and all of those kind of things are probably do stand out a little bit more than they should <laughs> nowadays because of the lack yep. of them. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yeah. So, so back in the corporate space, right? So how do you, how have you in the meantime, when you've been in other situations and you see maybe some of the dysfunction or pettiness that happens in regular corporate space? I mean, it must be hard for you sometimes when you go, oh my goodness, I was, you know, we were able to deal with all this <laughs> stuff and we're stuck in the Antarctic. You get to go home at night in this lovely office in the middle of you know, Melbourne. Why can't you guys get it together? It's funny, that's, that's the, the, the pandemic has, has brought this home to a lot of people. So mm -hmm. that's what we dealt with for a year, that we, had, we lived together 24-7 and we were so different. As I said at the start, we were such different people from such different backgrounds. And, and just, I wanted to create a culture where people would speak up deal with issues and move on because my two mm -hmm. big fears was someone spiraling with depression or someone yeah. exploding with anger because I didn't feel I had the tools to cope with either scenario. So I thought, right, how do I create a culture where people will speak up, deal with things uh, not, not take it personally, you know, play the, the ball, not the person mm -hmm. and, and deal with it. And I think I, I say that now to corporates that, you know, it keeps coming back to that respect Trump's harmony bit saying, stop trying to force people to, agree uh, and particularly if you want innovation if you want creativity having that group think is the last thing you want the last thing is you want people all sitting agreeing with each other you actually yeah. want difference of opinion and you want diversity in your team but sometimes the challenge of diversity is that people don't see eye to eye so it's about saying that's okay that's, that's how you get yeah. fresh ideas it's great you know it's it's how you handle conflict that's that's the most important thing and that's where you, you use your you know triangles to to build respect and I think it's it's kind of it's it's very fascinating for me because we live in this pervasive culture now where it's almost um, where people think that everybody has to agree and everything has to be, you know, work should be, you have should be happy all the time. All of this kind of <laughs> yes. craziness, right? And and um, I do, and it and it comes that people can't can't handle different ideas. They can't handle disagreements. They can't handle and and they try to get they try to come to a crazy consensus, which at the end of the day isn't a consensus really. It just means that some people kind of surrender and give up and go along <laughs> with things. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's a huge lesson because we need to get back to that kind of creative conflict that you have when you have different people and the ability then to say, okay, well, um, you know, my idea didn't go forward this time, or at least they, they listened to me and they took my input. So great, I can get behind this now instead of like trying to have everybody happily in agreement all the time. Oh, it's so true. And I think I, I do a lot of work with um, what we call the, and you guys call the essential services. And for, for a mm -hmm. lot of people in essential services, such as cleaners or even hospital staff, not, not nurses, but the, the food food staff or yeah. catering staff, they, they go to work because they want to earn an income to support their family. Yeah. And that's it. And, and I think to say to them, you need to be passion, you need to have passion for your work. Um, I think it's really insulting because they, they don't, they just, they want to do a work, they want to do a good job. They mm -hmm. want to do the best yeah. they can, but they don't aspire to, to anything else. And that's okay. We need to, to say to people that's to validate that and say it's perfectly fine if you need to go to work or you want to go to work to earn an income to support your family and you've got no big career aspiration mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that I totally respect that and I respect other people who want this big career so I think yeah it's the same thing isn't it that you you, you say I respect that difference it's great yeah. you need the difference yeah and absolutely I mean I think that's an, and I think that's also for 
I think sometimes people feel pressured, you know, that they don't have a big, they don't have a big plan and a big goal. And I would think it's okay if that's, if that's what you want, as you say, yeah. if, if your priorities are different or if your priorities are, I'm going to work to earn money, feed my family, send my kids to school. And that's the height of it. Right. Um, the rest of the time I want to be with my family or whatever. That's fantastic. If that's, if that's what you want to do, if you're somebody else who wants to go further, great. But I think we shouldn't force the same expectations on everybody. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and that's, that was the deal with my team. I had people on the team who did not leave the station for the whole year. They were there. It's, it's a well paid job because it mm. <laughs> needs to be well paid. Uh, and they, mm. were, they were genuinely there to save for a deposit for a house. And they made mm. no, you know, no secret about that. And it really irritated some of the other team who were there for the experience. They were there to right. see the penguins and the wildlife. And I had to say, but that doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Like if that, that's their values and your values yeah. are different, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Just respect the difference. Yeah. And the penguins are there because they live there. So that's their motivation. Yeah. You know, they're <laughs> they're plenty right. of fish. So, you know, everybody's got their own, everybody's got their own <laughs> motivation. So I have to ask you, so if they called you up tomorrow and said, uh, you ready for another year, would you do it? No. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> I better give you context. Um, yeah. If I could go back as one of the team and I could relax and I could have a glass yeah. of wine and I could, I could complain about head office, I'd think about it. But as the leader, um, when you're on duty 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week for a year, uh, no, the, the scrutiny is intense. And I think every leader knows that. Every leader knows yeah. when you walk into the office people are watching you and they're judging what kind of mood you're in and your behavior mm. and what, what's happening, particularly during times of change. So even, even if it's a um, merger or an acquisition happening or, yeah. or a restructure, people are sort of on edge watching the leader and that we know that, but then we, you go home at the end of the day and you can get away from it. But when you're living there for a year and, and particularly when you have a difficult conversation with someone about their performance and then you sit down at the dinner table and they're sitting yeah. right next to you, you know, yeah. it, it's really excruciating. And so that, that bit is the, the intensity and the scrutiny of the leadership role for me, it, it was too much. It took me months when I got home to get, to get used to being back home um, because it was such an intense experience and you're, you're in the spotlight for a year, every yeah. moment for a year. Yeah, no, I think I can imagine it probably took months, all right, for it to, to readjust. And I think it's also a good, I mean, obviously this was a very intense uh, experience, but I think it's a good lesson for those who aspire to be in leadership or high management positions is to, is to really think about it, to think, is that, is that what you want? Are you prepared to be, yes, you get to go home at night, but you're right, when you're at work, you are, um, you know, you're under observation, right? Everything you do, you don't yeah. get an opportunity. If you're not in a good mood for something that happened at home that's got nothing to do at work, well, guess what? People at work are going to think it's something to do at work. Oh, is the company okay? He seems in a bad mood this week. Absolutely. Okay? That's absolutely. Don't get a break. Abs yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and that's what I, I do a lot of work with emerging leaders and young leaders. And I say that to them. And they're, they're confounded that they haven't changed from, from five o'clock Friday when they were a team member to 9 a.m. Monday when they're suddenly the team leader. They haven't changed. And they think I'm, everything's the same. And I have to say, no, everything has yeah. changed. You're now managing your friends. Uh, and yes. you're deciding their career opportunities, you sign off on their annual leave, you decide on um, promotions and secondments, all that sort of stuff. So I said, so everything has changed. There's a, a real yeah. power imbalance now. So you're not one of the boys anymore. You're actually yeah. a leader and everything. And it's a really hard psychological transition because you yourself haven't changed, yet everything yeah. around you has changed. And it's a really difficult one for young yeah. leaders. I think, and I think, uh, you know, yeah, I think the hardest one is when they all go to the pub without you for the first time. Yeah, that's the, yeah. yeah that's it hurts. The, certainly, in our, certainly in our cultures, it's one of the first ones where you just go, it hurts. And then, and then you realize that, okay, I get it. Because if I was there, they wouldn't be able to talk about it. They wouldn't feel just, free. Yeah. And you also um, have a, a legal obligation, and that's what yeah. I found in Antarctica. I, I could have, stay and have a glass of wine with my team, but sure. then I'm, I'm legally and morally obliged yeah. because it's a workplace mm -hmm. that if I see any evidence of bullying or yeah, yeah. Mis misconduct, I actually have to step in and deal with it. I can't just mm -hmm. be standing there and go, oh, well, I'll pretend I didn't see that happen. And for me, yeah. it was like, no, you know what? I, I'd just rather go to my room and read a book. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's a 
good thing for people to consider all these things before you do go into that kind of leadership position to realize that, yeah, there's a great rewards for it, but with everything in life, it comes with certain compromises and you just got to make sure that you're willing to make those compromises. Otherwise it's going to be a difficult road. That's it. You got it. Yeah. Listen, uh, Rachel, this is fascinating. We could talk all day, but um, <laughs> I should, uh, I should probably bring this to a close. Um, all of Rachel's information will be in a contributor bio below this video, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. So now I'm presenting all around the world. I was uh, actually working uh, I'm in Seattle, I think, next week, uh, obviously yeah. virtually. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, in Colorado, I think the week after I was in London last week. So I present to teams all around the world on, on leadership and teamwork and just practical stories, but lots of great photos of Antarctica and videos and, and just talking about what I learned, particularly leading out of isolation. So coming home mm -hmm. and some of the lessons I learned about coming home and the impact it had on me and I, I predict will have on a lot of people as we come out of lockdown. So yeah. it's, it's, been a fantastic ride and as we've come back to the start it, it's only because I saw this job advertised in a newspaper and decided I'd rather regret what I did than regret yeah. what I didn't do so it's a really sliding doors story. Absolutely I think that's a fantastic message to take away and particularly now because I mean so many things have changed that uh, maybe this is a time for people to start thinking about doing things they never thought about doing before take a couple of chances uh, you know, life as we know it is a, is a tenuous thing absolutely right. spot on yeah listen thanks again rachel my name is john golden sales pop online sales magazine pipeline of crm see you all for another expert interview really soon thank you yeah.